Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Citizens Participation and Public Petitions Committee in 2022. Uh, we have apologies from the Deputy Convener this morning, David Torrance, who unfortunately can't be with us. But we are joined by Marie McNair, MSP, as his substitute, and I'm delighted to welcome Marie to our proceedings. Good morning, Marie, and welcome to the committee. And we're also joined online this morning by uh, Paul Sweeney, our colleague uh, who is participating remotely. Uh, we come to our agenda. The first item is, given that this is Marie's first appearance with us at the committee, a declaration of interest. And I just invite Marie to identify any declaration she would wish to make. Uh, good morning, Convener. I can confirm I have no interest to declare. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us then on to item two, which is consideration of existing petitions. And we are going to start with petition number 1887 to create an Unborn Victims of Violence Act. This is a petition that was introduced uh, by Nicola Murray and from whom we heard evidence when we last considered the petition. And I would just say that our original hope was that we would have been able to convene this further evidence session at our first meeting after the summer recess, but it was just difficult to get everybody together at the appropriate time. So uh, a little bit later than scheduled, we are now considering the petition. It urges the Scottish Government to create an Unborn Victims of Violence Act, creating a specific offence that enables courts to hand down longer sentences for perpetrators of domestic violence which causes miscarriage. And we are joined this morning by Dr Mary Neill from the University of Strathclyde, Stephen Tidy on behalf of Victim Support Scotland, and Marcia Scott on behalf of Scottish Women's Aid. And thank you all very much for coming uh, to speak with us today. Now, members have a number of uh, questions they would like to explore this morning. Uh, so if the witnesses are quite happy, we'll move to the first question. And if you could indicate when you wish to speak, and I will come to you in turn. And I suppose let me just open up the, uh, the, the question, because we had really, I think, a, a very compelling evidence session with the petitioner herself. Um, there's quite a bit of further evidence that we want to be able to uh, to take. But um, I think just as a general introdu introductory question, the views of the three of our guests on the evidence on the level and impact of domestic abuse during pregnancy. And would anybody like to just give us some sort of indication of their general feeling in any one of these on this? Yeah, Marcia, if you'd like to come first. I don't need to touch that. No, you, but you, your microphone will be operating for you if you're okay. not. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think it's not um, uh, much of a secret that women um, who are uh, experiencing domestic abuse are at much greater risk when they are pregnant. The, it's not exactly clear whether that's just because they are more engaged with services that then, that then monitor and, and track the injuries um, and the abuse that they're experiencing. But there is no question that the data tells us that women who are pregnant, who are living with an abusive partner or have an abusive ex-partner are at really high risk of injury and um, uh, of significant abuse. And this, you know, I, I think it's very difficult to get your head around why that, why that's okay. It's all domestic abuse and why that's okay is I suppose a big question for all of us. Um, uh, and I, um, I really support NHS um, efforts to try and identify this abuse, but I, I think that it's part and parcel of what happens when somebody with a high need for control um, uh, is involved with somebody who's pregnant. And interestingly, and obviously these issues will come out in questions that will come forward from my colleagues, but in our evidence with the petitioner, um, what... What has been your experience of the degree to which this goes unreported because uh, victims of this violence in the situation in which they find themselves uh, feel it difficult to actually come forward and discuss? I think it's really important to take all of the data about prevalence with a very big um, uh, grain of salt, I suppose. I think I've mixed up my metaphors there. But... Um, I think one in 12 women who have reported um, in the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey um, say that they have reported to the police or to the health service, one in 12. So the, the number of, the amount of unreported abuse is a mountain compared to the, the rather large 60,000 police calls we have a year around domestic abuse. The, the barriers to disclosing are massive for women. And... Um, 
we know, for instance, we have routine inquiry in um, uh, maternity services, and um, and that's a good step forward. But what we don't have are guarantees for women when they disclose that the the criminal justice system will respond swiftly and robustly enough to keep her safe. And also, if she's financially dependent on the abuser, which is more often the case than not, especially um, if she's pregnant um, or, and mothering, um, uh, what, are our, what are our arrangements in place so that she can put food on the table so she can take care of herself and, and her unborn baby? I think um, uh, those are just some of the issues. And, we, you know, and then we could, we could dive in. And I think that is the elephant in the room here with this bill, which is heartbreaking, this story. Um, uh, which is the failure of our system to respond appropriately to perpetrators. Yeah. Mr. Tidy, can I come to you? Yeah, well, I uh, support uh, Marshall's comments there. I mean, I think we certainly support lots of, of, uh, of people who have found themselves subject to domestic abuse, and I think it is very much an underreported issue, even still, since we've had all the domestic abuse legislation over the recent years. I think the uh, interesting thing was the Crown Office its submission in relation to how many people have actually been charged with an offence relating to an assault of a woman who's been pregnant. That's very small numbers. Um, but what the real picture is, is, is very much an unknown. Dr Neil. Yeah, I would, I would endorse what um, both of the other witnesses have said. Um, the only thing that I would add to what Marcia has said is that um, as well as people who are in uh, already abusive relationships, um, experiencing an intensification of abuse during uh, pregnancy. It's also, there is also some literature that suggests that relationships that haven't previously been abusive uh, can become abusive during a pregnancy. So it's a very vulnerable time. Uh, and sorry, just uh, can I tease out a little bit more just on that final point? Uh, uh, that, that What are you saying? The pregnancy leads to uh, a greater instance of domestic abuse. Uh, the, the, it, it, what were the circumstances... That would that would pr pr promote that. That's not necessarily clear, um, but there is definitely some evidence um, in studies that that show that um, not only does abuse intensify during pregnancy if it's already present. Um, in some cases, it can also uh, begin. Pregnancy can act as a trigger for for abuse. So, what had been a a relationship without abuse can find that the pregnancy itself has been something that has led for, to that being introduced into the, into the relationship. In some cases, that in seems some to cases. be the case. Yeah. Um, thank you all very much for that opening general point. Uh, it, Mr Ewing, can I come to you? Uh, thank you, convener, and, and good morning to all the witnesses, and thank you for, for your, your evidence thus, thus far. And I understand absolutely, Dr Scott, this is a huge area of concern. Um, the particular aspect that that Nicola Murray has asked us to consider and uh, is, of course, the proposal that there should be an unborn victim of violence act. And that is her focus. And she did give in her evidence session in June this year to this committee um, a very articulate, but also very moving and harrowing account of her own experience where she lost children. She, she said she lost a child, I lost children. My children lost siblings, and my parents lost grandchildren, um, and thereafter the, um, the assailant was charged, was convicted of a lesser offence and fined £300, which obviously rankles probably forever. Um, I, I wanted to ask a few specific questions with that background in, in mind, because that's what we're specifically asked to do rather than consider the, the hugely important wider issues which the witnesses have quite rightly talked about. And one is the issue of whether or not um, there should be a new offence or whether we simply use the existing statutory uh, or common law offence and adapt that uh, to libel, if you like, that the, the uh, acts of violence have led in, in a causation to the death of an unborn child. And it, it's, I guess it's perhaps a legal question, so I'm not quite sure if all of the witnesses are able to, to answer it. It may be the Crown Office and the Sentencing Council are really the, 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 the people that we, we, we may want to, 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 to ask this later. But I just wonder if what your, each of the witnesses 
views are, convener, to that first question. Should there be a specific new act or offence uh, of causing violence to, uh, to, to, to an unborn child, leading to the death of that unborn child, I imagine, in most cases? Or can we use the existing, um, the existing kind of weaponry of, of offences, statutory or common law? Who would like to? Dr Neil. I am, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. So the first thing uh, to say is that I'm very strongly of the opinion that there needs to be a new offence. Um, and uh, I wouldn't frame it in the terms that, uh, of the petition. Um, I wouldn't frame it as an Unborn Victims of Violence Act. Um, and I wouldn't um, uh, frame it in a way that might suggest that the victim is the fetus. Um, and, and that's something that I'm happy to come back to. Um, but I do think that there needs to be an offence. I think um, the law as it stands, the, the, the domestic, both the, the Domestic Abuse Act that we have um, and the common law that could be applicable um, are wholly uh, ill-equipped to deal with this. Um, I think trying to uh, attach this to existing law looks like and, and would be tantamount to doing nothing. Um, it would be leaving things as they are leaving Scotland as an outlier in the UK. Every other jurisdiction in the UK has an offence of this nature. Um, and I wouldn't support using that existing offence in the rest of the UK as a template for what we should do in Scotland. I think we can do a lot better. Um, however, we are an outlier at the moment um, and not in a good way. If I could just probe you on that. I mean, it's... Um, I can understand that if there's an entirely new act, obviously that of itself uh, creates clarity, certainty, it draws attention to this particular area, and those, those would be good things, I think you're arguing. But why have you formed the view that the alternative of using the existing measures um, with the flexibility that is inherent in Scots law, particularly the ability to libel different types of charges of assault or, or culpable homicide or, or even um, murder, uh, the existing common law offences are, are very flexible and they can be used so that the, the Crown Office of the Fiscal can libel, as I understand it, from my practice of distant memory now as a criminal lawyer, uh, can libel different circumstances in the charge using the flexibility of the... Why, why is that not... Um, surely it's a matter of will and practice and determination of the authorities to actually follow through and take this seriously that might be the, the issue here, not the inadequacy of the legal framework, which could be used uh, to adapt the existing uh, charges. Yeah, I, mean, I would begin by saying I don't think there should be a completely new act. Um, I would favour an approach that would involve amending the, the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018. Um, I, I have favoured that approach since that act was a bill, um, and I proposed at the time that an offence, a new offence should be created as part of that bill. So that's very much the framework within which I think this belongs. Um, so, um, but to, to answer your question, I think there are, there are numerous reasons why I don't think that trying to use the existing law would be the right approach. Um, one um, important reason, I suppose, is that if, if we try to um, use existing law and other charges um, and attempt to, to punish this kind of harm or loss um, via those charges, this becomes almost secondary and an afterthought. Um, it becomes uh, not the primary harm or loss that the law is focusing on. Um, and I think for, for a victim, for someone who experiences this kind of harm, this is, I've called it in the past, a serious and distinctive loss. It's a, a very unique type of loss that can only be experienced by somebody who is pregnant. Um, and to have that tacked on, if you like, to existing uh, to other charges about um, the, the attack on the body of the victim, I think doesn't do it justice. Uh, and I think, again, I would reiterate that it seems tantamount to doing nothing. It's the status quo. I do think there is a huge problem of, um, the, about the will to um, use the law that we have. I think I'm not, probably not the best person to speak to that. I think someone who represents victims um, um, would be better uh, placed to speak to that. Um, but I think... Um, that's, there are two separate problems here. There's the problem with what the law does and how the law um, does not acknowledge and address uh, this kind of harm or, and loss. Um, there's the, the separate problem um, of lack of will 
Um, and I think we need to address both of those things. I think one thing that we need to be careful of, um, although I, I, I'm adamant that we do need a new offence, I think we need to not let that offence act as a gloss or a mask that distracts us from the other work that needs to be done. That's very helpful. Um, I don't know if the other witnesses have comments. Marshall. Dr Scott. Yes. <clears throat> um, I, I agree with some of, of what was said and, and not all, but I, I suppose the... Um, what I, what I would say is that we have uh, the world's gold standard domestic abuse law, according to Evan Stark, um, which is far from being implemented um, completely inappropriately. Um, somebody said in a meeting I was in yesterday that, well, Jen Wallace from Carnegie, that Scotland has an um, implementation um, uh, disorder. And I, and I would say that, well, so do a lot of other countries. But I think that we need to pay really close attention to what is and isn't happening um, uh, in the implementation of the domestic abuse law. And one of the most significant features of that law that made it so innovative is that, it, that the crime is committed based on the behaviors of the accused rather than the harm to the victim. Um, and we were very much in favor of that, in part because who's at fault here, but also because um, for decades, women um, and children have been telling us that the, the process of testifying in court was um, uh, traumatizing, as traumatizing often as the abuse they experienced. And what they would say was, if they were calm, and in control, they were clearly lying. And if they were upset, upset and hysterical, they were not reliable witnesses. Um, and it was this, this sense that, that the, the severity or the, the unacceptability of the behavior of the abuse all rested on the impact on the, on the victim. So to come back to your question, I think that the law itself has the tools that we need the difficulty is the rest of the system, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and I would say um, it is a distinct kind of loss and harm alongside, a, you know, a myriad of others that women experience because they're women. And the loss of their children, the, you know, the, the murder of their children in domestic abuse cases. Um, and what we need to do is to fashion a system that responds appropriately to that. And I think... And I know this isn't your question, but I'm, I suspect it'll come up, and I'm happy to address it then. But there are um, the potential for unintended negative consequences from framing an offense this way are massive for women who are experiencing domestic abuse. Just Mr. Tidy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the law needs to reflect on the harm that's been caused to the to the victim of crime. Um, the, petition, uh, the petitioner who gave her evidence quite clearly at that time, the law didn't reflect the harm in terms of the sentences that was given. So I think the law accurately needs to reflect on the harm that's caused, whether that be through um, the sentencing that's, that's, that's handed out, the charges being ad adequately reflecting uh, the loss of that child. I mean, there's a combination of lots of different things that the system should do for victims of crime that perhaps it might not be doing at the moment or didn't in the petitioner's case. Um, well, well thank, thank you for those responses. Could, could I ask just a, a related question, please, which is that in Nicola Murray's case, and I suspect other cases, the um, original charge libeled was reduced uh, a, in respect of her particular case, and she wasn't aware or consulted about that. Now, of course, the, the fiscal, the Crown Office, are rightly independent of politicians and so on, and they have that independence which they cherish. But do the witnesses consider that in these particular circumstances there should be a duty, whether created by law or practice, upon a fiscal or um, lawyer handling a particular prosecution to consult with the victim prior to uh, a, the decision being taken to reduce a charge? In the case of Nicola Murray, it was the reduced charge that led to the monetary penalty of £300. And, uh, of course, we have to be very careful of not making judgments about a case because we, we, we weren't there. We didn't hear all the evidence. The, the, the judge does, and 
I don't mean to make any value judgment here. I cannot do that because I'm not in a position to do that. But as a matter of principle, do the witnesses consider that, that given the, the gravity of the consequences which Dr Neil rightly described, there should be at least a consultation. Uh, the the decision-making power probably has to rest with the prosecution authorities at the end of the day. But should there at least be a form of consultation required prior to the acceptance of a reduced charge or uh, by the Fiscal or the Crown Office? Um, I would like to say, I think there's two issues in what you've raised. The, the fact of downgrading charges and then the, the engagement with the, with the uh, complainer. Um, and, uh, and the downgrading of char charges in our experience and the, the 300 pound fine, I mean, it's that kind of shocking story. We hear those all the time. Um, and they reflect a system that starts from the failure to collect the evidence that the Crown Office needs to prosecute on the charges that have been made. Um, and then the, the process of the pressures on the, on the um, Crown Office to, to prosecute, but also in a speedy fashion to get court, to get cases through. You all will be well aware, I am sure, of the 40,000 cases in the backlog from the COVID. Um, and then the pressures on the system not to, to um, administer custodial sentences um, because of the prison population, which is a whole another discussion. But um, from, from our perspective, there's no way of fixing that whole trajectory by just uh, talking more to the, to the, to the complainer. You, you know, the, we have to take a look at the whole process that allowed or that, that influenced the Crown Office because they don't want l lower charges, uh, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things. They look better when they, when they get convictions for, for more significant ones. <clears throat> um, so we need to look at the whole process from the beginning of disclosure to collecting of evidence to reporting to the Crown Office. Th those are the issues. I totally agree that the, the failure to speak to the witness, to the complainer, um, and I, that's been addressed, and I, I sit on, along with the Victim Support uh, Scotland, the Victims Task Force, and we've been talking about the failure of communication with witnesses. And I know that there's a pilot, and Stephen, you probably know more about this than I do, I think in the Hamilton area, <clears throat> looking at, at changing the way cases are, are um, uh, processed um, to make sure that, that the fiscal involved is in communication um, with the complainer because we, we hear so many cases where she, if she's lucky, she meets the fiscal on the day of the trial. So, yeah, thank, thank you very much. It's very helpful. Uh, just, Dr. Neil. Just thank you. Very briefly, um, I think intuitively, having read the petitioner's evidence, she clearly experienced that as, as further trauma. Um, and I think every opportunity to avoid further trauma to a victim should be taken. Um, I agree with, wholeheartedly with what you said, that the decision about uh, the charges ultimately needs to rest with officials. Um, but that doesn't mean that there can't be communication um, and there can't be forewarning um, of, of the victim in a case like that. So I don't want to dwell on this point, but I would just endorse what Marcia said about it um, and also endorse what you said about... Um, where the decision-making power needs to rest, um, but that we can we can allow it to rest there while still being compassionate to the victim and avoid re-traumatising her. Thank you. Anything to add, Mr Tidy? Yeah, I, I would just say that the, well, there's a whole problem with the way witnesses and victims are dealt with in the court system in terms of um, the, the amount of times currently cases are adjourned, witnesses and victims prepare themselves to go to court and they're adjourned with very short notice, i.e. they turn up at the court and are told to go away, maybe after sitting there for a couple of hours, for various reasons. So I think communication with victims and, and witnesses needs to be a lot better. Um, and, and certainly when it comes to individual charges, if they're being lowered, that needs to be communicated in a trauma-informed way to that victim of crime to, to have a full explanation, a full rationale as to why that, that charge, what they expected to be heard, has been lowered. Okay. Um, I, I think... Um Perhaps these are points that we need to pursue with, with others, namely the Crown Office and the, and the Sentencing Council convener, but that's for a later date.
OK, thank you. Dr Neil, can I just follow up? I mean, you made reference and the... Um, Nicola Murray and her evidence made reference to the fact that Scotland stands alone and that there is a far uh, higher um, level of protection in law, at least, or, a, or an offence that can be pursued in law elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Can I ask you, that, given that that sits and exists, what impact has that had on the way these matters are pursued or the incidence of them elsewhere in the UK? I mean, let's establish, agree, that this does sit apart and there is a, diff a separate offence and that therefore can be pursued in that way. What has been the impact of that legislation in those jurisdictions? So we're talking about fairly old legislation, both in England and Wales and in Northern Ireland. So in England and Wales, <laughs> it's governed by the 1929 Act, the Infant Life Preservation Act, um, which was originally acted for a different purpose. Um, but that purpose is now purely of historical interest. And in recent decades, that act has been used solely to punish violent men who cause um, the, the loss of a pregnancy through their violence in, in the pregnancy's late stages. Um, and, and Northern Ireland, um, it's the Criminal Justice Act of 1945, which is really just transplants the English and Welsh crime into Northern Ireland. So they are old laws, um, but there has been um, an alarming um, increase in recent decades in the number of convictions for child destruction, which is the name of the crime in the rest of the UK. In the rest of the UK. Um, there's been an alarming increase um, in convictions for that crime um, in recent decades. And we know that the same kind of behaviour happens in Scotland. So in the UK jurisdictions where the crime of child destruction exists, that is um, libelled as a separate charge alongside charges such as assault or attempted murder or grievous bodily harm. Um, in Scotland, um, only the, the charges relating to um, the offence on the person of the victim um, that we have can be charged. There is no additional charge. So it's something in England and Wales and Northern Ireland that's charged over and above assault or attempted murder. We have cases, recent cases in Scotland um, with really shocking facts where um, somebody could have been charged additionally with the crime that I've proposed, um, but for the fact that, that we don't have that crime here. And, and have they led to successful convictions under those two um, in Northern Ireland and England under those specific provisions of those yes. acts? Yes, people have been charged and convicted with child destruction um, for uh, committing the kind of behaviour that we're concerned with here. And has that, uh, forgive me, just a, a generalised question, but has that led to, would you say, a, a different kind of sentencing and consequence? Well, yes, it's, it's, it's something that is... Like the person is sentenced for that as well as whatever else they're convicted for. Um, so it obviously adds to, to the person's sentence. Now, sentences obviously can run concurrently, so sometimes it's, um, it's purely expressive. Um, but the law does have an important expressive purpose. Um, and the law in the rest of the UK um, expresses its um, strong disapproval um, for, for this kind of behaviour um, through the existence of a separate crime. Um, and in Scotland, we're not doing that. Um, and I think that we ought to be. And, uh, sorry, I don't mean to, to quantify it in this way, but I'm just interested to know, does the, the practice in England and Wales come down to a compensation order in the same way that we have here, or is, is that...? A, a... The crime of child destruction in England and Wales carries a maximum sentence of uh, 14 years in prison and life uh, in prison in Northern Ireland. OK, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Uh, Marcia Scott. Can I just um, add a couple of things to that? I um, had a conversation with uh, my counterpart at, in Women's Aid Federation England um, to discuss uh, these issues. And she related to me that a number, and this relates to what I was talking about, about the completely unintended potent, but negative consequences potentially here. Um, talked about women who are actually victims having been prosecuted for child destruction. Um, uh, and since we know our system is far from calibrated appropriately so that, um, that women who are actually victims don't get arrested, unfortunately they do still, um, uh, then um, if you can imagine what would have a more chilling impact on the possibility of disclosing domestic abuse if you were pregnant than... Um, than knowing that you you might in fact be accused of um, 
at, at best failure to protect the fetus. So I think I think we need to be very very cautious about and especially look at what's happening in the United States around some of these laws. The the other thing I think is worth pointing out is that our law allows prosecution under the domestic abuse law uh, sentences of up to 14 years, which is far higher than than um, the domestic abuse laws in in the rest of the UK. Um, and I don't think that evidence from any of these indicates that we have been particularly effective in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, or Scotland at um, reducing perpetration. And that is what we should be looking at, I think. Um, and we can tinker with the laws as much as we want, but if we tinker with them without dealing with the problem. I mean, at the last time I saw the data, and I think it's slightly different now, but um, something like 1% of the total um, of convictions for domestic abuse wind up with a custodial sentence over a year. Okay. And may I just, before I come back to Dr. Neil, just when you say that uh, women might potentially find themselves uh, subject to prosecution mm -hmm. under the um, provisions in England, is that a, a hypothetical or is that something that has happened? No, it's or, happened. It's happened. And, and it, what, uh, is there a, is there a, a generalised way in which the circumstances of those prosecutions arose? I've, re I've reached the limits of what I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. so. Thank you very much. Dr New, you wanted to come back in just on the back of that. Before I do, I can pick up on that point. Um, in England and Wales, um, the there is one prosecution outstanding for child destruction, um, and it's a, a woman who's being charged with it. Um, in other cases, um, I'm not aware of any convictions for child destruction that have involved women in England and Wales. Um, uh, although um, they could, in theory, be charged. Um, and, and I think it's very, very important to say that in Scotland, um, we can avoid the entanglement of um, this kind of crime with abortion law. Now, this crime, the crime of child destruction, is messily entangled with abortion law in the rest of the UK. And that's something we can completely design out of any new law that we enact. Um, and the wording that I proposed when I gave written evidence to the domestic abuse Bill Committee, I think it was the Justice Committee, in 2017. The wording that I proposed would have completely avoided that. Um, it's very easy to draft a, a clause or a, 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 a section that excludes the possibility of criminalising women or their doctors. Um, that's been done in Northern Ireland. Um, the 2020 regulations in Northern Ireland um, changed the crime of child destruction there so that women and their doctors can no longer be prosecuted for it. Um, and we could easily do that here. We could easily um, hermetically seal this new crime away from abortion law, away from the, the possibility of criminalising women. We can and we should. Thank you very much. I'm going to bring in Alexander Stewart now, who I think is going to take us in a slightly different, uh, or this sort of different aspect of the okay. petition. And thank, thank you, convener, and can I thank the witnesses for their evidence so far. When you've talked this morning, you've touched on the aspect about under-reporting uh, and that the victim is the most important person here. When, when we had Nicola Murray here and she gave her evidence, she spoke about the difficulties about reporting and the cooperation that's required between the police uh, and the, the individual who has been abused. Uh, and she talked about the, the difficulties that are there, the knock-on effects. Now, we know that Police Scotland have looked at domestic abuse and, and seen it as a priority, uh, but, but she also... Uh, explained that there were some more was required and that could be more training was required more support was required because she felt that when it came to coercive behavior uh, that maybe the, the police were not as up to what they should be in dealing with that so that was a gap that she identified uh, when when you're having been you know abused and then trying to progress that uh, you go to the, the first authority, which is your police, before you then go into the court proceedings. And within that, there seemed to be a gap uh, that, that she identified herself as being a victim. Uh, uh, and it would be just useful to see what you uh, believe or what your views are on that. Uh, because, as I say, there is a role here for Police Scotland uh, to manage the situation and support the victim. Uh, and as, as, as Mr Tidy knows, that, as I said, the victim is the most important. That's what we, 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 we acknowledge that. But, but that may not always be the case when it comes to how they are managed and how they are processed by the authorities who are there to protect and support them. Uh, and that was a gap that she saw, and it would be good to hear your views on that. Thank you, Mr Taylor. 
Yeah, I would just disclose, first of all, I was a police officer for, for 20 odd years. I retired last year. So I'm fully aware that police don't always get it right in terms of the information and support they provide to uh, victims of crime. What I would say is there is other organisations, such as Victim Support Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, who can uh, fill that support gap, potentially, for uh, victims of crime uh, and uh, provide that emotional and practical support to, to victims of crime, even if they've not reported to the police. So that, that support mechanism, I know Nicola mentioned it, mm -hmm in her uh, um, kind of evidence to yourself that she felt as if there was very limited support available to her. Um, but there is support and I would, I would um, kind of advertise the services that are available to victims of crime uh, to support them, whether they've reported to police or not. I mean, the training aspect for Police Scotland is one that's, that's ever evolving um, uh, that because the law is constantly evolving. There's always new legislation that comes out and trying to, for police officers to keep up to date with all of that legislation uh, is, is, it requires a lot of training, a lot of investment and in, in time for officers to keep themselves up to date, but um, they should provide that um, kind of factual information to uh, victims and witnesses. But then you've got other organisations such as ourselves who can provide that other support. And if, and if victims feel as if they, um, they've got a knowledge gap, then that can be filled by our services as well. Marcia? I'm not quite as kind. <laughs> um, although I, I, I have to say there's a, there's a number of things to say here. First of all, I did speak with um, uh, a, a police officer at strategic level prior to coming here about what the tools were that they had for, for um, uh, gathering evidence and reporting to the Crown Office the, the kind of experience that Nicola Murray recounts. And... Um, and the the response I got was frustration at the failure of the system to to do to use its tools appropriately, uh, and she said that you know there's a there's there are charges existing, um, you know uh, assault with severe leading to severe injury. The the question, however, that I think is really important here is that is the comments about coercive control and and the ability of police officers to identify that. And we, now, we know that coercive and controlling behaviors are the single variable that most predict lethality. Um, so if there is nothing else that's really critical um, that police officers should be identifying is um, are there coercive and controlling behaviors being exhibited by the, by the potential accused? Um, and we know that, and this makes me very unpopular when I say this, but um, we know that the existing um, risk assessment, which is the dash RIC um, that is used by first responders and police, um, in, in the hands of those who are not um, dealing with domestic abuse cases all the time, is, is insensitive to coercive and controlling behaviors. So what we have is a risk assessment that essentially privileges physical violence. And since that's the background that most police officers also come from, we have a system here that has a law that says you must pay attention to these things, but they really don't see those things many, many times. Or if they do, there's a hierarchy of harms. And if there is a physical assault, they're much more likely to, to focus on that. So I do think, um, I think there's a training issue. I think there's a problem with the existing risk assessment and the College of Policing has done some really interesting research about how to, how to adjust the way the dash RIC is used so that it becomes more sensitive to coercive control. Um, uh, but also it's about gender. You know, police officers need to understand what the impact of, a, of, of being a woman who's being abused, who's subject to coercive and controlling behaviors um, uh, who has potentially um, had a miscarriage prior to this, who's been said, why didn't you just leave? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and why would she disclose? She didn't, get, she didn't get help the first time. You know, I mean, I just think that there's, there's a, a whole set of factors in the system that need, that need improvement. But starting with being able to identify coercing and control, coercive yeah, and controlling control. behaviors is critical. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I would I would endorse that last point wholeheartedly. I think it is 
imperative that we become better at identifying coercive control. Um, and in the wording that I submitted as a, as a suggested draft clause um, in 2017, I specifically mentioned coercion as one of the, the, the things that could um, be uh, the, the underpin a charge of this kind. Um, because I feel very strongly about, about the importance of coercion too. Um, I don't have a, a lot to add um, on the question that you asked directly, but as a, as a kind of tangential but still, I think, important point, um, I would just want us to remember that there are also other crimes um, with primarily women victims um, that are underreported, that are difficult to persuade people to come and give evidence about, um, that are prosecuted with varying levels of success, but which we don't suggest shouldn't be crimes for those reasons. So just because something might be difficult to, to prosecute, because it might be difficult to get a victim to report, because it might be traumatic for a victim to report it and go through that process, we don't say that rape shouldn't be a crime. Um, and, and likewise with this. And, and you know, you've, you've all identified uh, that, that, that the victim in this whole process is the person who has to go through that trauma again and again if they're indicating when processing through to the court situation or the circumstances. Uh, they are being, once again, abused in another way, uh, or, they, or they believe that that, that, that becomes the situation. Uh, uh, it it, it re-emerges, and their, their, their whole situation re-emerges. Uh, and I think that's another big issue that we need to think about uh, as to how, how that is managed, how the person is supported. Uh, and you've identified the training requires to take place, but at the same time, you know, the focus should be on the victim. Uh, to make sure that the victim is getting the support mechanisms that she requires by the agencies who provide that to ensure that they have the confidence. Because what we're hearing here is that women don't have the confidence of what's happening with the police at times. They don't have the confidence uh, because they, they feel that they're going to have to go through this trauma once again. Uh, and, and that then stops them from, from dealing with the situation and circumstances and ending up staying in the relationship for some extent, because they feel they can't, they, they can't get out of it. And the coercive behaviour continues because they're, they're financially bound or they've got a situation, circumstances, that they can't leave. Can I? Sure, can I just add that it's... We, we try really hard not to frame it as a problem with the victim, so it's not about her lack of confidence. No. It's about the fact of what, what we know from, um, you know, libraries of qualitative evidence about how decisions... Um, how um, victims and survivors make decisions about when and where to, and to whom to disclose is that it's a very complex calculation mm -hmm. of risk. Mm -hmm. So if they choose not to disclose, it's very often because their assessment is it will put them in more danger right. than they are already in. And I think it's really important that we, because I think people think it's a self-esteem issue. Well, it's not. It's, a, it's about a calculation of risk. Exactly. Thank you, Kinkin. Um, Paul Sweeney, who is online, is going to ask a couple of questions. Paul. Thank you, Convener. I think it's very compelling evidence from the panel so far um, in regards to the need for this, and particularly around the issue of fair labelling. I think that is actually a extremely um, compelling point that has been made as well today. Um, I, I noted that uh, Dr Mary O'Neill had mentioned she had drafted the clause in 2017. I, I suppose that in terms of trying to reach a set of firm proposals um, about how to take this forward, um, what remedy would be satisfactory to the panellists? I know there's been discussion about having a statutory aggravator rather than a more, uh, that can be coupled with a more general offence as a potential remedy. Is that something that would be satisfactory? Um, in terms of a specific offence, is an opportunity to consider the Scottish Law Commission's current projects. They're currently doing two projects, one on homicide and one on aspects of family law, which come close to the topic in the petition, but neither actually covers the issue raised. Could those projects be adjusted in scope to incorporate this, this issue? Um, and perhaps there are other proposals. There, there could be a member's bill that, that an MSP could bring forward in that sense, if there was support um, in terms of the drafting of it. Um, I just wonder if um, any of the panellists have thoughts about potential options to, to take this matter forward in a practical sense. Dr Neil. Thank you, Convener. Um, so the first point I would make is that um, in the evidence that I've referred to, um, my written evidence in 2017, I included a, a statutory aggravator alongside the proposal for a new crime. So I proposed both a new crime um, and also a statutory aggravator, um, whereby the, the 
the pregnancy of a victim would aggravate the offence of domestic abuse. Um, and that was to capture situations where a pregnancy ha hadn't been lost or where the, it was impossible to prove causation in terms of the loss and the, the abuse, um, just so that across the board, if somebody abuses somebody, the victim's pregnancy aggravates the offence. So that's the first point. Um, the second point about how, how to go about enacting uh, a change, um, I think... Um, the idea of a member's bill doesn't appeal to me personally at all because I think we don't need a standalone act. All we need to do is amend the Domestic Abuse Act. Um, I think that would be smoother. It would be the most legally coherent way to effect the change that's needed. Um, and it would lead to a, a more, by no means a comprehensive uh, domestic abuse law, but a more comprehensive domestic abuse law that, than we have at the moment. I, I, I think it's very important. Framing and labelling is all very important here. Um, and I think it's very important that this new crime be framed as part of the law of domestic abuse um, to avoid some of the fears that, that, that people legitimately have about um, fetal rights or who's the victim here. And I think uh, framing it within the law on, on domestic abuse really um, underscores that. So I, I don't think a member's bill would be um, the right way to go because we don't need a standalone act. Um, with a member's bill, the member becomes the face of the issue. I think that's probably not important here either. Uh, not, not appropriate here, sorry. Um, because I think the focus has to be on, on, on those who we're, we're trying to serve um, with this. Um, so I think the Law Commission, finally, to, to come to that. Um, the Law Commission does excellent work in all of these areas. Um, and certainly, I think there could be a really interesting academic project for somebody to, to make um, comparative international studies of the laws in various jurisdictions. But when it comes to this particular issue, um, I think the, the direct and most relevant comparison is with the rest of the UK. I think we have all the information that we need on that. Um, as someone who's been immersed in all of that for, for a number of years now, I think we have the information that we need. Um, we know that we're an outlier. Um, and I think um, there's, there's nothing to stop us acting now. Uh, I, I don't think this needs to be um, incorporated into a work programme. The Scottish Law Commission's work programmes run for five years. Um, I think that could be seen as long grassing the issue. Um, um, and I wouldn't want that perception to be created. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on Mr Sweet's question? Marsha Scott? I would just say... Um, I think the idea of an aggravation is very interesting. Um, uh, we have concerns about the way the, the existing child aggravation is working, um, but I think that reflects some of the concerns about the rest of the system that I've already, that I've already shared. I do think there's an opportunity um, uh, that, that amendments to the bill would be an opportunity to take a look at, the, at, at this aggravation, at an aggravation about the, the way we framed children in the bill, which was not what we wanted, and it's turned out that we were right, it's not working very well, um, uh, and, uh, and take a look at some other opportunities for us to improve it. And I think um, uh, that, that exploring an aggravation in this, in this situation, in, in part because you're, you know, what, whatever the causa, causal links are, we do know that pregnant women are um, very, you know, very overrepresented, I suppose, in the in the injuries and harms um, uh, to victims uh, data. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, convener, and, and, and thank you to the contributors. Uh, I think that's a really helpful uh, contribution just to try and hone in on what practical measures would be most effective. Um, I think the point about the Law Commission is helpful, um, as well as the, the, the root of the Members' Bill. Um, I think those are, uh, you know, your reasoning is, 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 is good there. I think I agree with that. Um, if, if we already have a kind of shovel-ready or kind of, you know, pre-built um, solution, um, how best do you see it being taken forward then? Would the government be have to be persuaded to adopt this measure and use government time to see it through? Is that what we need to focus on as a, as a, as a clear action as a, as a committee to try and affect that? Is that the best way forward? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'll come back to you, uh, Dr Neil. But I mean, I should also just say sometimes with members' bills, um, the bill itself is the catalyst which leads to the government adopting the proposal rather than the bill itself. You know, it's very difficult sometimes to quantify the success of members' bills because quite a few, on quite a few occasions the objective is actually a, achieved because the government understands and adopts the issue. But uh, what, what, what are you thinking on Mr Sweeney's point there? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, one of my main anxieties around a member's bill is, um, first, the optics of it, um, the idea that it becomes the, the, the issue um, of a, a named individual MSP. Um, but another anxiety that I had was about the, the prospect of success. Um, and obviously, members of the committee will know far more about that procedure than I do. Um, so, I mean, I would defer to your knowledge about what's the, the likeliest um, way of doing this successfully. Okay, thank you. But I, I, uh, Mr. T Mr. Tidy, uh, we would also support the domestic abuse uh, act being the, probably the yeah. most appropriate vehicle for this. But what I would also say is that the sense sentencing council guidelines may be more an immediate um, kind of, um, target for uh, amending and changing. I know they're going to consult uh, in, in the near future on guidance in relation to this. So we would uh, certainly be kind of supporting that being looked at in terms of the guidance for uh, um, judges. Dr. Neil. Thank you. Uh, just to come back on that, um, I agree, and I think that obviously these are not mutually incompatible solutions. I think we can pursue a number of solutions at the same time, and each of them might be serving um, complementary purposes. So I, I would be in favour of um, a multi-pronged approach to this. I suppose I should say also, uh, wearing another hat, I know that there are currently 19 uh, members' bills <laughs> and it's a record number by this stage in a parliament and we're already probably at the point where it's unlikely any further bills will have much prospect of success before 2026, uh, which is quite alarming. Mr Ewing, just finally. Yeah, I just wanted to, to ask Dr Neil, given that she, as she said she's been immersed in this and you've alluded very helpfully to practice in England uh, Wales and Northern Ireland, if she may be encouraged to submit any further material which you think may be helpful to guide our deliberations on this, because plainly the experience in England and Wales, where they have a specific statutory offence and Northern Ireland, is relevant. And the more information we can glean, convener, about how that, how that compares with what's happened here, the better, I think, for us in guiding our deliberations. I mean, we will, we will reflect on these matters further at a subsequent committee, but I think possibly the committee could agree now that we might want to write to one or two organisations just to find out a little bit more about the experience in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, just to help inform us. And we're drawing, we're coming to a conclusion. We've, we've, we've gone a little longer, but it's been a very interesting discussion. Is there anything, finally, any of our um, witnesses this morning might want to add that maybe they feel we've overlooked in our conversation? No, in which case, thank you all very much. That's been hugely valuable to us as a committee, considering the issues of the petition. Very grateful to you for your time this morning. Colleagues, you're content that we consider the evidence afresh at a, a future com committee meeting, and I'll therefore suspend the meeting briefly. Thank you all very much.
Uh, hello again, and our second petition this morning is petition number 1871, a full review of mental health services, uh, led by Karen McEwen on behalf of Shining Lights for Change. And um, before I proceed, I wanted to say that in a moment we will be discussing suicide and other challenging topics. So if you are joining our proceedings this morning, and should you, while watching, know of anyone who's struggling, the NHS 24-7 Mental Health Line can be reached by dialing 111. Uh, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to carry out a full review of mental health services in Scotland to include the referral process, crisis support, risk assessments, safe plans, integrated services working together, first response support and the support available to families affected by suicide. And we're joined by Karen McEwen this morning. The committee does not routinely hear from petitioners. However, we were very certain that we felt it would help us to have a proper understanding of these issues by having Karen with us and an opportunity for her to speak to the committee about why her petition is important. And we really do thank you very much for coming through to Holyrood today uh, and taking the time to speak to the committee. And she's joined by our parliamentary colleague, Monica Lennon. Monica, good morning. Who, I won't say has a season ticket to the committee, but she's maybe got a bus pass to it at the very least, but um, an assiduous supporter of petitions, and who, of course, spoke uh, in support of this petition when we first considered it um, some time ago. Um, we'll obviously have an opportunity to uh, invite uh, Monica to contribute to our proceedings um, after... Uh, the, con the conclusion of questions that may have come from the um, committee. And can before we do, uh, is there anything you'd like to say? I suppose my introductory paper would be to ask you, question would be to ask you if you would like just to talk about your own experiences and why you have highlighted these and brought them forward in the petition as you have. That's, thanks very much. Um, I would just like to thank the committee for allowing me this opportunity to give evidence in person and to thank Monica for her continued support from the very start. Um, but today I'm here to be Luke's voice. It's not about me, it's about Luke. Um, my partner, Luke Henderson, sadly took his own life on the 29th of December 2017 after we asked for help eight times a week before his death. We were begging for help, and Luke was begging for help. He didn't want to die, but he just felt as if there was no other choice because there was nowhere that was offering us help. He was very unwell, and he was having visual and audio hallucinations. But, as I said, no one would help us. Every door was closed in our faces. We were at a loss of what to do, and I was that worried and concerned that I stayed awake to try and keep him safe at the detrimental to my own health. I woke up in that dreadful night to find the love of my life, my soulmate and best friend, dead. Our two children had to be carried over their dad's lifeless body with tiles over their head by the police. The effects of the 29th of December will be forever in our hearts and our lives. The events of that night turned our lives upside down and we felt pain we never thought was imaginable. We now, ha we now have to live our life without looking at it. And we've got so many unanswered questions, pain, guilt, and the frustration of being let down. My own mental health has suffered, and I have now become a shell of my per a person. What supports have I had from NHS? Very little that I haven't had to fight for myself. That's why in the 2018 Action Plan, it says that there should be more support for people that's been affected by suicide. And then again in the 2022, but what I've seen no evidence of these supports. I've not, not received any of these supports, and, not, and nor has my kids. I've had to fight for everything. That I've, every single bit of support I've got, I've had to fight for. I'm not telling you this today to get sympathy. I, do, I just want to share a wee bit of what life's like for me, having to live with this pain and for my family. And I'm not alone. There is many people out there that feel the exact same way as what I do, that feel let down and that are supporting this petition. And th these people are very happy to speak to the committee separately as well, because we all feel failed and we've all got a common goal for reform and change. Now, just to address some of the issues that I feel that's gone wrong with the 2022 Suicide Action Plan, it repeats many of the aims of the 2018. But my question is this, how are these aims and goals assessed? How do we know that these policies that are in place are working? 
We don't because there's no assessment process in place. We need to find out what's working, what's not working, where funding needs to go and what services are, are, are doing good that we can try and implement throughout the full of Scotland. What I would like to mention is I welcome the introduction of addiction and inequalities in the suicide plan, which is well overdue and should have happened many years ago. Recently, through my own um, research through Freedom of Information Act, I've mainly focused on NHS Lanarkshire. Previous evidence I've submitted was regarding the amount of beds that there was in NHS Lanarkshire. Asked further questions, and there is only 113 general and acute mental health beds. So that's people in crisis who need this support, can't get the support because of the lack of beds. That is in an area of over 600,000. So how can, the, how can you compare the amount of beds to the amount of people? It's just not possible. In 2022, 71, people took, 71 suicide reviews were carried out, which meant 71 people took their own lives while they were open to mental health services. This just isn't good enough. Waiting times are far too high. CAM services in Lanarkshire, the longest waiting time is 904 days. So that's a child waiting 904 days to get the mental health support they need. That's just not good enough at all. This, this could be a result of the lack of staff numbers, because through my Freedom of Information Act, some of the teams in Lanarkshire have half the staff numbers that they're meant to have. This has a knock-on effect on the staff themselves, causing high burnout rates. It also puts people off coming into the profession. Staff do not feel supported. They are having a hot desk. They are having to do the work for free people, and they are not getting supported by management or government. I would ask you to call for evidence from staff so that it's done anonymously, so they can be honest in what is actually happening in the front line, because what's down in paper and what's happening in the front line is two different things. It's not transpiring. Mental health failures can go back decades, even back to the First World War when it first became a thing. It's always been a Cinderella service of the NHS for many years, and although there has been more funding, it's still not equal in physical health. There's lack of beds, trained staff and services available for people. My whole aim today, and with calling for a review of the mental health service, is I believe the only way to determine is if public money has been spent wisely is to carry out a review. The only way to determine whether risk assessments are working is to carry out a review, because I don't believe they are, as my partner was... As my partner was put at a low risk of suicide, even though past risk assessments, just with his his history, put him at a high risk. So that time before his death, how he was low risk, I don't know. And they can be manipulated. Accident and emergency is not appropriate for people to go in mental health crisis. As we already know, at any waiting times are through the roof. And it just, it's just not viable for somebody who's struggling to sit there for 11 hours while they're trying to get mental health support. This is why I would love to see a separate either hub or separate accident emergency somewhere in the hospital that people can go and get immediate attention and the help that they need and require at that time. This would also have a positive effect in the NHS waiting times. As so many people go through a &E with mental health, that was documented in my, one of my previous submissions. My final point today, because I could go on all day, about the different failures, is mental health shows no discrimination on age, sex or gender. And at this point, any one of us could be sitting in the same position that I'm sitting in today. Anybody in this country could. One in four people suffer from mental health. So it's, it's highly... It's highly likely that one of us, one of you will feel the same one day. Nowhere in mental health seems to be getting it right. That is from the community, the prison service, in the military, ex-military and our youths. 
and our youths their future. We need to protect them and we need to get it right for them. I plead with you, I plead with the committee to please call for a review of the service, please call for evidence from staff and call from evidence from the public to see how, where they feel let down and so that you can see what's transpiring in the front line is completely different from what's on the suicide plans. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. And I know Alexander Stewart's going to pursue the scope of the review that you would like to see in just a moment. But um, can I just ask, obviously we are new to this as a petitions committee, but I understand in the previous session of Parliament that you were able to bring forward a petition at that time uh, too. And I just wanted to understand in your own mind what the differences are in relation to the petition you brought then and the petition you're bringing now. I wouldn't say there's many differences. What I would say is the things that I had asked for in that petition has not been completed. I do not see... They, they put in place a hub and how that transpired was it was the NHS 24-7 um, has dedicated mental health advisors um, that you can call up, but you don't see anybody. This was a service that was used... With when look, I had called this service and spoke to the mental health nurse, and I know this service doesn't work. We actually, in order for them to be able to assess look, they have to be able to see see what how he's presenting to see if he's responding to voices, because over you can't do that over a phone. And if he's saying, "Oh, I'm not hearing voices," when you're actually assessing someone in person, you can see whether they are responding to voices or not. Okay. Thank you. So, in a sense, whatever assurances or um, conclusions that were drawn when the petition was considered in the previous Parliament, the delivery of that, the execution of any of that, uh, has fallen short or has not materialised such that these issues need to be brought back into the centre of our attention again. Is that essentially the reason? And I also think that mental health was bad before COVID, COVID has highlighted a lot of the failures and a lot of negative things towards mental health and it's only continued to get worse and it's only continued to get worse until we get social policy reformed. Yes. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. Thank, thank you, Convener. And, and can, can I thank you for your, for your evidence and your, the, the courage that you've had to say what you've said today. Uh, you talk about the failures being abandoned and being let down uh, by this whole process. Uh, and you want to see a change and you want to see a review. There already are some areas the Scottish Government have put in place already, uh, and, and you're probably well aware of those. Uh, you know, the, we, we, we talk about the, the suicide prevention, uh, and we've also got the, uh, the Scottish Mental Health Law Review report. Uh, you, you've probably seen all of those. But what would you like to see You've talked about today some of the experiences of individuals uh, and, and, as we know, uh, men seem to be a, a much larger percentage who do have suicide situations and circumstances. Uh, but it, you, you've touched on what you would like to see the review deal with. Uh, uh, it would be just, again, just to go back over slightly where you, where you think the gaps are and where you would see that review progressing. I think there's a lot of gaps in the system, um, so we'll go, go right from the start, from early intervention. Education has to be a big part of this <coughs> for our youth. Our youth need to know it's OK to talk, it's OK to feel not OK, because they don't at the minute. Like my own daughter, the first time she heard mental health was only after her dad died. That should be something, tools should be taught in school so that youths understand these feelings and these are okay. So early, that starts off with the early intervention. And then we can kind of come on to the debrief intervention. This is a service that's for mild to moderate mental health conditions. That's not what it's been used for. People in crisis have been sent to this. People in crisis have been sent towards apps, um, which thousands of pounds have been spent in apps. And I've had a look at these apps myself and there's no way they help me, never mind someone in crisis. Once we get to being in crisis and getting into the service, the waiting times, we can't get, you can't get into the services because of the waiting times. I wasn't able to get adult services waiting times. I only managed to get CAMS and I think I was shocked 
booked at 904 days was the longest waiting time in Lanarkshire. And that would probably be across the board. So I think more needs to be done in terms of that. Staff need to be more supported. Staff aren't being supported. They're having a hot desk. And it's getting to the stage where I've spoke to many staff who's left the NHS to go into office jobs because they just can't take the stress and pressure, pressure anymore. So a lot needs to be focused on supporting the staff. And then coming to crisis point, I feel there's a lot of gaps with crisis because going sitting in an accident emergency for hours while you're in a psychosis, while you're hearing, while you're hearing the hallucinations or visuals, how can they sit in that environment when accident emergency waiting rooms are very busy? It's unrealistic, it's harmful to them, it's harmful to the public. So I think we need to see a separate either a hub, accident, emergency, a separate entity where people can go and receive crisis support for their mental health the same way as they can do physical health. And, you know, the, the, the Scottish Government do have the new suicide prevention strategy that has been launched and that, that is their blueprint as to what they want to see happen. Do you have any confidence in that, no. that strategy? If the 2018 plan didn't work, which they had put in place, which has pretty much got the same goals, the only difference is, is that they have included inequalities um, in addictions. And there is a link between addictions and mental health, which has been ignored for many years. And it's just could progressively get worse and worse and worse. So that is a positive from that action plan. But... Let's see how it transpires to the front line. And who should the Scottish Government be talking to? Who should they be taking evidence? I mean, you've given some compelling evidence as an individual who has experienced the trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, but who else should the Scottish Government be trying to embrace to capture the real situation and circumstances that are out there? The staff. But I think it needs to be done in a way it's anonymous because no staff wants to whistleblow for fear of backlash. Um, so it has to be an anonymous way that they can open them up and feel that they are not going to get any backlash from it because they won't, they won't open up and tell you. And the staff probably know how bad the services are because they're just as scared probably what I'm are. They've, I've spoke to quite a lot of staff um, and the things that they've kind of told me scares it really, really does scare me, and it's scary to think that this is our youths that we're talking about, this is our future generation, because they are, they are this country's future. Thank you, Convener. Can I ask, uh, just to try and understand, I mean, obviously the history of the way that we approach mental health has moved considerably in the lifetime of this Parliament. Certainly when I joined 15 years ago, we were still at a point where uh, many, there was a, tremendous element of stigma about it. There was a real reluctance to even discuss these issues. There were two or three MSPs across different parties who who made, uh, who made, were champions, really, of the whole way in which the Parliament embraced the need to approach mental health differently. And in the sense that that's been successful, um, there is, I think, a greater willingness now uh, for people to come forward or to talk about mental health issues. And in so doing, that creates a far greater a number of people who are trying to access services. So even as services, uh, you know, are expanded, the demand uh, is increasing. And as I think you've rightly articulated, the uh, pandemic and the freeze on being able to progress a lot of um, work that was in progress at that point became problematic. I, I suppose I don't quite understand how all this operates in practice. In, in acute medicine, there's obviously a difference between somebody who has uh, suffered um, a heart attack and requires to be dealt with, or somebody who is having elective surgery for um, a knee replacement. But in the, in the hierarchy of mental health, um, is there an assessment, do you think, of the severity or the nature of the um, incidence of individual um, in, individuals presenting with mental health issues such that some who might be in need of very acute and immediate support find that they are simply in, in a bus queue, essentially, without 
necessarily anyone understanding where the priorities within all of that lie in the way that they might do within traditional health medicine. Definitely. There's, there is an assessment process. So once there's a referral goes in from the doctor, um, there's a multi-agency meeting within the, at the mental health services and they discuss like what's appropriate, whether it's psychology or whether they need a CPN, they kind of determine there. However, wh where the staff are kind of got their backs up against it is they don't have the staff and their caseloads are already absolutely through the roof, so they can't take on more caseloads. So even when they know somebody is in crisis, they need immediate help, their backs are against the wall because they don't physically have the capacity to see these people um, and that's why you get a lot of missed opportunities to save people's lives. And so you were talking about some presenting at A&E yeah. which is not in your view the the, the right place mm -hmm. for them and that but essentially they were presenting with what you would call A&E in mental health terms um, but that if there were somewhere else that they could present in that acute situation within a hospital, that would be the ideal scenario. Was that, that your argument? Yeah. Um, I do think there needs to be somewhere that they can go and present immediately and get the immediate support. Because when you phone NHS, Lanning, uh, NHS 24 to get any help for mental health or to speak to an out-of-hours doctor or anything like that, what you're told is... Either contact the police if you feel that you can't keep them safe or yourself safe, or um, go attend accident emergency. That's the advice that you're told is to attend accident emergency. And I don't have the figures in front of me, but I know I did put it in my, one of my last submissions about how many people have actually attended accident emergency in the last three years, and it was it was rather high. And the amount of the people that were actually getting they are presented at accident emergency and the amount of people that actually went to mental health beds over a three-year period was something like 600 and odds. Um, I don't have the exact figures, but I know I did put it in my last submission. OK, thank you. Uh, Marie McNair would like to ask a question. Unfortunately, we don't have a video link, so it's likely to be audio only. Marie? Thank you, convener, and good morning, Karen. Um, can I obviously give you my condolences? the sad loss of your partner as well in such uh, horrific circumstances. Um, when you spoke um, at the last committee, um, you spoke about the issues you had with risk assessments um, and you were saying they were, you felt they were inadequate. Um, are you aware of, kind of any improvements in that area since you last gave evidence to the committee? I don't believe there's been any improvements. Um, I feel that it's still... The risk assessments can be manipulated um, and I don't just talk as seeing it from look. I talk from when I was a student mental health nurse myself. You, they could be manipulated, and you were actually told to manipulate them so that you could, didn't have to put people in, bring people in, or put them at high risk. So I don't think anything's changed with risk assessments, and I think they're very dangerous and they do not pick up the risks. Thank you. Thank you, and. Um... I mean, just out of interest, uh, following on Marie's question, are you aware of, has there been any... I mean, what was the experience in relation to that risk assessment? Well, Luke's past risk assessments, Luke's had done, because he had had to go to, into hospital a few times to get mental health help, and every past risk assessment, because he has history, he had a history of suicide attempts, there was a history of abuse, different other things put him at a higher risk... So even before we went to that service, he should have scaled high risk for um, self-harm or suicidal ideation. And I have a report to say that he was a high risk to go into suicide at some point, which was done in 2016. However, Luke's risk assessments was scored him at a low risk on the night before he took his own life. And I changed it to medium because I wasn't happy with it. So it can be manipulated. Thank you. Um, any other colleagues would like to ask a question? No? Um, thank you for that. It's been very helpful. Uh, um, 
And um, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground there. And I think we understand where you would like to see us move in relation to all of this. Monica Lennon, Monica, would you like to contribute further this morning? Thank you, convener. Well, I'm sure you'll agree that Karen's a hard act to to follow. And again, to thank Karen for the, the time and effort that she's putting into this. Um, Karen mentioned some of the, the FOI, some of the questions that she submitted, particularly to NHS Lanarkshire. Um, and I have to admit, when I saw some of the answers and some of the long waits, I said, I think we need to go back and ask them, are these the correct figures? Um, or have they not understood the question? So what we're seeing in black and white is is frightening. And, and Karen, through the work that she does locally with others with lived experience and voluntary work, um, does speak to a wide range of people. Um, I think Karen's also been very fair to try and find where there's been some progress. So the inclusion of um, addiction and inequalities into the strategy is good because a few years ago we met with um, the, the former mental health minister who explained, ah, the addiction side, that's for my public health colleagues. So there was that, <coughs> that sort of fragmentation. I think there is a better understanding that we need that holistic approach. But as you've heard from Karen and you've heard in, in written submissions um, from, um, I think, the Royal College of Psychiatrists and, and, and others that the capacity just isn't there. So I think if a review is to happen, it needs to, you know, in real terms, look at the resource that we have, the backlog and challenges that we have. Um, we had an urgent question in Parliament last night about the a &E waiting times, which give a good, you know, window into what's happening in the entire system. And NHS Lanarkshire, which we've talked about today, um, has reached um, an all-time record low in terms of those waiting times. So Karen is absolutely right. For people who are in crisis, being in that a &E environment is just not suitable. In fact, it can make everything worse and put them more at, more at risk. So where are the trauma-informed services? Where are the quiet spaces um, I think I would like to hear more from Police Scotland colleagues. Um, I know, again, locally in my region, when I'm speaking to to police officers on the front line, um, that they're feeling the pressure. Um, you know, and there's been some good training rolled out um, across police and, and other frontline services. Um, but that's another sign that the system isn't working. We know how hard it is to get that face-to-face -face contact in primary care, not just with GPs, but others. We know the role of community pharmacy, um, um, advanced nurse practitioners as well. So I don't doubt the good intentions from Scottish Government and those working at a high level to, to run our health services. Um, but when we build in the backlog and the whole recovery agenda needs to happen, you know, I, I do believe that we need to create that space to have a really honest, independent look at what's happening. Karen's touched on the need for education and prevention and early intervention. And I think, Convener, you're absolutely right to talk about the journey that we've been on in this country to try and destigmatise mental health, to make it easier to have these conversations. But I think we also have to recognise that there is a spectrum. And I think Karen is, is right to say that you know, if someone has some low mood that's very temporary, um, low level anxiety, some of these apps, some of the signposting that we know about, that probably is appropriate. Um, but for other people, um, you know, with other mental health conditions that don't always get the attention and understanding the needs, that's not helpful. In fact, it probably is, is counterproductive. So I think it's it's really great that the committee has invited Karen today. I know you said it's not normal practice. I think that shows that in the parliament, all members understand this because, you know, sadly, um, the experience of Karen and Luke um, will resonate because we all know constituents who've been through similar um, experiences and tragedies. So, um, again, I just want to 
back up everything that Karen has said. Um, I know that in Parliament um, we struggle to find the capacity in our committees and in the chamber to, to give issues the, oh, you know, the, the time that they deserve. I hope that when you hear from, I think it's the Cabinet Secretary or, or, or the Minister, the, the Cabinet Secretary, I hope that government won't be defensive because you know, I know Karen very well now. We've been working together for a few years now. All the constituents who come to me, they're not looking for reform out of anger. They're not looking to blame people. You know, Karen spoke here, I think, very um, with great affection for the staff, for those on the front line who are trying to hold it together. And often it's their own mental health that then suffers. So we owe it to everyone in Scotland, including the workforce, you know, to really step back from this. So I hope that government won't be defensive because I think we all recognise there are very good intentions, um, but it's that gap between the high level strategy and policy and actually the resource and the experience on the ground. Because we know that we have to train the workforce. When are people getting the time to do that right now? Um, so I think you've mentioned, Alex Stewart mentioned a couple of the, the relevant reports and strategies and that work is very welcome. We've been speaking about that a lot. Um, I think the, the report, um, I didn't print it off because it ran to something like 900 um, pages, but the Scottish Mental Health Law Review report uh, is a massive document and the summary I think was about 113 pages. So I think that tells you that this is complex. There are so many layers to it. But to go back to where Karen started, Luke didn't want to die. Luke wanted to live. You know, he loved his family. He loved Karen. He loved his children. He wanted to live. Um, and there's so many other families that carry that in their hearts. Um, so the suicide prevention work is important, but it's also about making sure that everyone can live well and live their best life and that our NHS, you know, continues to be the success story that we all want it to be. Um, but I'll end there just to say I fully support Karen and uh, again thank the committee for all your work on this. Thank you, Monica Lennon. Well, if the report's almost 900 pages, that's almost as many days as I think you said the, uh, the waiting list was. And it did occur to me that this parliament will have dissolved potentially um, before some people are... Um, at the front of that waiting list because that's getting close to 2026 before people are going to be uh, be being seen and, and I think that is uh, an indication of the measure and scale of the issue. Before we close, Karen, is there anything further you would just like to add in conclusion? No, I just I would really like to see a fit for purpose mental health service and that is my aim. It's no anger or anything. I just I don't want any other family having to feel the pain that we have to feel every day because it's horrible and I would not wish it on anybody and we just we need we need a fit for purpose mental health service so that this stops happening. Well, we have the cabinet secretary at our next meeting where we'll be able to pursue a number of these issues. Um, I'd like to thank you, Karen, for your courage and resilience. Uh, it's been uh, a privilege to have you with us this morning to discuss these issues. And I know I speak on behalf of all the committee when I wish you and your family uh, every happiness in the future. Thank you very much. And I'll now suspend briefly.
Um, hello again, and uh, we are now looking at petition number 1812 to protect Scotland's remaining ancient native and semi-native woodlands and woodland floors. Uh, petition lodged by Audrey Baird and Fiona Baker, from whom we've previously heard, uh, on behalf of Help Trees Help Us. And the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to deliver world-leading legislation giving Scotland's remaining fragments of ancient native and semi-native woodlands and woodland floors full legal protection and now this was the original aim of the petition, before COP26 uh, in Glasgow in November 21. Um, and we're currently, of course, in the middle of COP27, but the issue remains one of concern. We last considered the petition the 4th of May, and we then in indicated that we would like to go as a committee and visit uh, some of these issues and went to Press Men and Wood in East Lothian on the 21st of September. And I'd very much like to put on record our thanks for the Woodland Trust uh, for hosting us and uh, looking after us that day. At our last consideration, we also agreed to write to Scottish Forestry and to all local authorities seeking information on the operation and enforcement of tree pres preservation orders. And we've now received responses from Scottish Forestry and from 22 local authorities and again from the petitioners themselves. And throughout our consideration of this position, petition, we've heard that a number of issues are impacting the effectiveness of current woodland strategies and policies and the protection of our ancient native and semi-native woodlands and woodland floors. And we also heard evidence and possible areas for improvement, including prioritising the development of inventory of ancient woodlands, strengthening the legislative framework and language in existing policies such as MPF4 and taking steps to improve compliance and enforcement. And we heard from the Minister as well uh, in consideration of all these matters too. So we've now been on a visit. We've heard from the petitioners. We've heard from various uh, representative organisations. We've heard from the Minister. And I just wonder, colleagues, where you think we on the balance of all the evidence we've received, we think we would now be most comfortable in going. Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. As, as you've identified, the, this has been quite a journey for us, but it's been very informative uh, and good to have uh, a reasonable large number of local authorities come back uh, and indicate where, we, where they stand and where the situation is. So I think it's appropriate to now write to the Scottish Government to highlight the evidence received and set out recommendations to address the issues raised by the petition. Uh, and also to write to the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee and the Rural Affairs Island and Natural Environment Committee to share the evidence uh, and the committee's recommendations. Uh, and, and members uh, can, can clarify that uh, with the clerks here and, and put information together. But as I say, it has really been a very in-depth and uh, process for all of us to be involved in and has been really quite successful. And as a committee member, I've certainly learnt a lot more about this whole issue. And I think that's vitally important that we can now... Uh, give that evidence uh, to uh, the Scottish Government to highlight the, the, the issues that we found. So would, would uh, colleagues be content for the clerks now to summarise the evidence that we've now heard from the various parties to bring forward uh, some recommendations that have arisen out of the conversations that we've had and for us perhaps just to have a look at that at, at a future meeting ahead of submitting that by way of a formal representation to the Scottish Government and to the uh, Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. Would that meet with the committee's approval? It would. Right. Fine. Thank you very much. Um, petition number 1837 to provide clear direction investment for autism support uh, this petition has been lodged by Stephen Layton and calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to clarify how autistic people who do not have learning disability and or a mental disorder can access support and allocate investment for autism support teams in every local authority or health and social care partnership in Scotland. And we last considered this petition on the 4th of May and we agreed to follow up with the Minister for Mental well-being and social care on a number of points raised during our evidence session and in response the minister has detailed a range of ongoing work to support and invest in people with autism um, i'm pleased to say that the petitioner has said that he's actually satisfied now with the outcome of the minister's response he states that the letter is a safety net that ensures all autistic people in scotland have the legal right to at least an assessment of their needs and because the petitioner is satisfied, he's requested that we close his petition and has thanked the committee for its hard work on this matter. I'd like to thank Mr Layton for bringing his uh, petition to the committee. Uh, and we are pleased to read 
positive reflections about your experience upon, upon engaging with us on this matter. So I'm delighted that uh, that has led to a successful outcome. Uh, and therefore, with the committee's agreement, we will conclude. Uh, we will close the petition. Are we agreed? We are. Petition number 1862 um, to introduce community representation on boards of public organisations delivering lifeline services to island communities. I'm almost surprised to have to say we don't have Rhoda Grant with us this morning as, a, as we consider the petition, but if she's watching, good morning. Um, this petition brought to us by Rona Mackay, Angus Campbell and Naomi Bremer on behalf of Eust Economic Task Force, and it calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to introduce community representation on boards of public organisations delivering lifeline services to island communities in keeping with the Island Scotland's Act 2018. We considered this petition just very recently at our meeting on the 28th of, uh, 26th of October when we, heard evident, we took evidence from the Minister for Transport, Jenny Gulruth, MSP, and, and Fran Pacitti, Director of Aviation, Maritime Freight and Canals at Transport Scotland. During the evidence session, the Minister and Director both shared information on the progress being made to encourage Islander representation on boards, such as being more proactive in how the roles are advertised, as well as making it an essential criterion that applicants for non-executive directors have a good understanding or knowledge of the issues affecting island communities. Uh, do members have any comments or suggestions for action? Mr Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Uh, uh, delighted that we have had such a, a robust outcome so far, but I think it's important that we do now uh, seek further information uh, and write uh, to the Minister of, of, of Transport uh, to find out the process of appointments to the boards for Dave McBride and also work being done to encourage candidates from island communities, along with to ask for an update uh, on the communities uh, and communication themselves from the Minister has had with HIAL in regard uh, to the proposals set out in the petition. Are colleagues content with the, those actions? Thank you, Mr Stewart. We are. Thank you. Uh, petition number 1867 to establish a, na a new national qualification for British Sign Language uh, lodged by Scott Macmillan. And uh, I would also uh, highlight that, that uh, consideration of this petition will, as we discuss, available to watch on Scotland's uh, Parliament's BSL channel. Uh, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to encourage the Scottish Qualifications Authority, the SQA, to establish a national qualification in British Sign Language at SCQF Level 2. Now, we previously considered this petition again at our meeting on the 4th of May, where we agreed to write to the Scottish Sensory Hub. We now have responses from the National Deaf Children's Society and the Scottish Sensory Hub. The National Deaf Children's Society state their hope that BSL can be afforded similar support and status as the Gaelic language has received. They also highlight that without a national qualification, we are unlikely to see sufficient numbers of teachers choosing to develop their skills in teaching BSL. The Scottish Sensory Hub notes that students currently earn more university entrance points for spoken language qualifications than for BSL, which they suggest results in students reluctantly opting for spoken language courses to maximise their university entry opportunities. Now, that is despite the increasing numbers of people wishing to take up BSL. And the Scottish Sensory Hub also highlight how the development of BSL qualifications and increased BSL fluency among the general population could have a positive impact on the well-being of deaf individuals and their sense of connectivityness in everyday life. I think any exposure we've had to BSL here has demonstrated that very visibly, I think, to colleagues in the Parliament. Do members have any suggestions for action? And Mr Stewart, you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I think we write to the Cabinet Secretary of Education and Skills to seek an update on the development of the next BSL plan and explore how BSL national qualifications could be developed. And in writing to the Cabinet Secretary, the Committee may wish to highlight uh, the development of GCSEs in BSL and other parts of the United Kingdom, ask what steps the Scottish Government are taking to ensure that schools have the opportunity to teach BSL from primary one to higher and advanced higher levels, and seek information on what further considerations the Scottish Government are given to affording BSL qualifications equivalent with other spoken languages, 
uh, as part of and may have on the uptake of BSL qualifications. Thank you, Mr Stewart. That's a, a series of comprehensive suggestions arising. Do colleagues have anything further they would wish to add? If not, are we content? And we are. Uh, petition number 1895, Mandatory Accountability for Nature Scots Decision-Making Procedures, lodged by Gary Wall, calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to make it mandatory for Nature Scot to explain its conservation objectives in decision-making within the framework of the Scottish Regulator's Strategic Code of Practice and the Scottish Government's guidance right first time. This is a petition we last considered on the 18th of May, at which point we agreed to write to Nature Scott to ask how it ensures the process for licensing refusals and reasons for refusal are both clear and consistent. Their response, Nature Scott's response, states that the approach is in accordance with the legislation following internal policy and procedures and that a record is kept of all assessments. In instances of refusal, a discussion does take place with the licensing manager and the unit manager is informed. Nature Scott states that the applicants are clearly informed in writing for reasons of refusal. The petitioner's recent submission to the committee reiterates his experience of a licence refusal where a conservation objective was not stated in the refusal explanation. He also states his view that the complaints procedure is not impartial as it is conducted by Nature Scott staff. Um, do members of any comments or suggestions arising as a consequence? Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I, I think that the, we are now at the stage that I think that the petition under uh, Standing Order 17.5 uh, can be closed uh, uh, under the basis that Nature Scott routinely issues licence refusals and it is stated the approach to it is always explained to the applicant and reasons for the refusal against the uh, legal text. Uh, and which can include uh, the objections. Uh, and the, the, the conversation uh, and objections that have applied uh, are every uh, licensing refusal, therefore setting uh, a mandatory requirement for Nature Scott to include these in every refusal would not be appropriate. And for those reasons, I would close it under Standing Order 17.5. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I, I realise, obviously, the petitioner's experience is not consistent with the... Um, representations we've received from Nature Scott, but I, I, I don't know that there's much more that we can do. We've received the assurances from Nature Scott, so I think uh, Mr Stewart's proposal seems um, really the only one open to us. So any colleagues have any comments, or are we content to close the petition? I think we are. I'd like to thank the petitioner for raising the issue. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know that we've really ultimately got the satisfaction that they might have hoped, but we have got the assurances and they are on record for Nature Scott. Uh, and obviously it is open in the future for individuals if they feel these uh, provisions are not being honoured uh, for it to be the subject of a future petition. Uh, petition number 1916 requests a public inquiry into the management of the Rest and Be Thankful project lodged by Councillor Donald uh, Douglas Filland and Councillor Donald Kelly. Uh, and this calls on the Scottish Government to instigate a public inquiry regarding the political and financial management of the A83 Rest and Be Thankful project, which is to provide a permanent solution for the route. This petition is one we last considered uh, quite some time ago on the 20th of April, and we agreed to write to Transport Scotland. We have received a response from the Minister for Transport, which indicates five possible route options are currently being assessed, with Transport Scotland expected to make an announcement and a preferred option for a permanent solution by spring 2023. We have also received a response from the petitioners, which restates their call for a public inquiry and highlights their concerns around the costs of finding a permanent solution for the rest and be thankful. And obviously there are huge issues attendant upon a public inquiry itself, not all of which are necessarily going to see us make the progress we might wish. But I wonder if colleagues have got any suggestions to make in relation to this petition. Okay. Mr Stewart? Uh, uh, you've... You've summarised, uh, uh, convener, where, where we are in this, and, and I do believe that it, it, it has been going for some time, as you've identified. But I do think, in light of the petition's concerns, that we write to the Scottish Government to seek information on what impact the capital spending review has on the funding of the A83 Rest and Be Thankful project, and whether the show, uh, the show 
will slow down uh, the funding of the road improvement project is likely to be impacted and the time scales of the seven to ten years uh, for the solution and the route to be looked at. You've, you've talked about the, the public inquiry uh, and I think that under that situation the, the investigate of potential and financial management of the AD3 rest and be thankful project uh, and seek uh, a permanent solution uh, for the route is still what the community want to have. But I, I, I think that in itself is a, a bigger uh, situation to try and deal with at this stage. Uh, so I, I, I would put forward these recommendations, convener, but I'm, I'm open to hear what others may have to say on this, on this topic. Mr Ewing. Yes, I, I agree with what uh, Alexander Stewart has just set out. And we'll just add that um, you know, I, I think looking at the response of Transport Scotland, who state that delivering a permanent and resilient solution is a priority that's welcome. The time scale for this is approximately seven to ten years. I think, I think that will cause concern and consternation in the parts of Scotland that are really essentially reliant on, on this link. And um, when it is closed, the, the detour is very, very substantial indeed, far, far longer than any detours, other detours of which I know, affecting such a large group of people. So, so I, I know that these things are complex, convener, but. I've just expressed concern about the length of time this would take and the fact that there doesn't appear to have been identified as yet the preferred solution, um, the preferred route and solution there to, to uh, provide um, uh, a reasonable transport links for those uh, in these parts of Scotland. And can, can I echo that. I mean, I think one way or another, this committee has been discussing it for seven to ten years. Uh, so, so uh, the idea that we're seven to ten years away from uh, 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 achieving what is yet not as such an agreed solution is a concern. Mr Sweeney. Thank you, convener. Um, whilst I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the points made by colleagues, um, I don't think it's helpful necessarily to have a kind of ruminating, backwards looking inquiry, which is often quite expensive and tends not to necessarily deliver improvements to operational performance. I think there's a broader strategic issue that the petitioner highlights, which is actually in Scotland and perhaps more broadly across the UK, we're incredibly inefficient at delivering major infrastructure programmes. And this is yet another dog of a project which has gone on for far too long. And the huge administrative cost associated with constant um, procrastination over it has, has been completely unacceptable. Um, and I would contrast it actually, interestingly, with the um, emerging structural problems that were identified in the M8 in central Glasgow, the Woodside Viaducts, um, where Transport Scotland have, within the last year, introduced an emergency structural repairs programme and rode roughshod over local public opinion to deliver um, maintenance of the trunk road network, which isn't necessarily what people in Glasgow want. Whilst, in contrast, this vital artery, which is critical to access of any kind to the West Highlands um, has been, um, you know, stagnating on the back burner for so long. So I think there is a broader issue that we need to use this petition as a device to keep the government and the Transport Scotland um, with, you know, t attention with Transport Scotland and the government to ensure that this is delivered in a timious fashion. And whilst the government has indicated a timeline into next year, which sounds on the face of it satisfactory, this petition might be a useful way of keeping check on that. Um, as a way to allow the petitioners to continue to ensure that this project moves forward at a satisfactory pace. Yes, I, I, I think as a committee we might be uh, ready to agree that we would keep the petition open until the very least we have a preferred route identified and some understanding of the timetable and underpinning financially of that recommended solution going forward. So are, are we content to do that? and to follow up on the suggestion made by Mr Stewart as well. We are. Thank you very much. And that brings us to item three, which is the consideration of new petitions. Um, the first of these is petition number 1949, review the rules concerning dual mandate MSPs. And this has been brought to us by Alexander James Dixon. Uh, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the rules regarding dual mandate MSPs and legislate to bring them in line with the Senate and Stormont by preventing MSPs from holding a dual mandate and to do this in time for the next Scottish parliamentary elections due in 2026. Ale Alexander reminds us that since the formation of the Scottish Parliament, 
MSPs have been allowed to take their place here at Holyrood while also retaining a role or dual mandate in other local or national levels of government. He says that members of the Northern Ireland Assembly are not permitted to have a dual mandate and members of the Welsh Assembly have a grace period of just eight days to resign if they also hold a seat as an MP. He also states that if Welsh Assembly members are a peer, they would have to take a leave of absence from the House of Lords. And if they hold a role as a regional councillor, they can remain in post so long as the expected day of the next regional election is within 372 days. As we do with all new petitions, the committee did request an initial view from the Scottish Government and in responding to this request, the Scottish Government has stated that in its view, it is the Parliament that is responsible for all matters relevant to its internal operation, including the terms of seeking its membership and therefore uh, not a matter for the Scottish Government per se. But I wonder if colleagues would be content uh, if we were to write to both the Welsh Parliament and the Northern Ireland Assembly to inquire about the deliberative processes that led to the introduction of the legislation that prevents dual mandates in those legislatures and any issues they have encountered in consequence of the imputation of that legislation. And for us also to write to the Electoral Reform Society seeking more information about the issues raised by the petition. In the light of which, uh, having considered the responses we might get, uh, we would be able, I think, to progress the petition to the relevant uh, statutory committee within the Scottish Parliament, who are charged with the responsibility for these issues, uh, given that the Scottish Government have said that they are not. Are there any other suggestions from members of the committee, or would they be content with that approach? Content? content. Okay, thank you. Uh, petition number 1950 to ensure immunosuppressed people in Scotland can access the Evosheld, is that pronounced correctly? Evosheld antibody treatment. Now, this has been lodged by Alex Marshall and it calls on the Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to enable access via the NHS to Evosheld pro prophylactic treatment for people who have zero or weak response to the COVID-19 vaccines. In raising this petition, Alex highlights that lockdown and shielding has not ended for many people with blood cancer, organ transplants and other form of immune compromise and suggests that treatments such as Evershell could offer protection for immunosuppressed people who have so far shown a zero or a weak response to the existing COVID-19 vaccines. Alex tells us that clinical trials have shown positive results and were found to reduce the risk of developing symptomatic COVID-19 by as much as 77%. As a result, Evershell was granted a conditional marketing authorisation by the UK Medicines and Health Mark Products Regulatory Authority, the MHRA. Responding to the petition, <coughs> the Scottish Government note that Evershield was developed and tested before the emergence of the Omicron variant, and further testing is required to establish whether this treatment is effective against the Omicron variants, although that was quite some time ago. This means that there is currently no established UK supply arrangement for Evershield. The Scottish Government also state that we'll closely monitor the outcome of further research and will write to update the committee in the event there is a decision to make Evershield available to petitions in Scotland. The committee have also received a submission from Blanche Hampton, who shares her experience as an immunocompromised person who has zero response to six vaccinations and is now shielding again. Blanche also highlights that Evershield is being provided in other countries with no negative effects being reported. Um, do members have comments or suggestions? Can I, just before we move to that, say I see we are dependent yet again on our old friends, the MHRA, with whom this committee has had dealings in the past and not always terribly satisfactorily. Um, so I'm just, when it's said that the um, conditional authorizations were granted prior to the Omicron variants and that currently no established UK supply arrangement for Evershield exists. Among any other recommendations we might have, I wonder whether we should be touching, uh, contacting the MHRA to ask them what the current status of any evaluation is that they might be undertaking, uh, because it does seem to me that the Omicron variants uh, became apparent 
really quite some time ago now, and I would have thought there might have been a little bit more urgency about assessing what the um, Evershell implications might be. And I'm also note that the petitioner says, or that our the submission from Blanche Hampton says that it is being provided in other countries with no negative effects being reported. And I just wonder whether there's any way we can establish any practice in relation to that and maybe draw that to the attention in due course of both the MHRA and the Scottish Government. Because for people in this situation, this all seems to me, and we've seen them reported in the media and elsewhere, uh, a hugely debilitating and exclusive to them, sense of iso a continuing isolation when the rest of the world has largely moved on. And it seems very unreasonable that we aren't progressing expeditely every opportunity to make life for them more acceptable. Are there any other suggestions from or comments from the committee? Mr Stewart? Thank you, Convener. To write to the... COVID-19 Clinical Review Panel to seek information on the considerations they have given to making Evershell available uh, as an antibody treatment uh, to patients and to write to the Blood Cancer UK uh, and the Kidney Research UK to seek their views on, on the, the, the issues that have been raised by the petition and also to write to the Scottish Medical Council to request the, the review of their decision to wait uh, for the NICE report to provide access via the NHS and Evershell uh, treatment for people who have no or a limited response uh, to the COVID-19 vaccinations uh, and to invite the petitioner and any uh, patient campaign groups uh, on Evershell for the UK to give evidence. I would suggest okay. the following. I don't know if I heard, Mr Stewart, but did, did you include Blood Cancer UK, Immunodeficiency UK and Kidney Research UK as organisations to whom we might write you content we yes, approach them as well? absolutely. Fine. Are there any other comments or suggestions from the committee. I mean, we've got the response from the Scottish Government. Would we be able to slip in an extra question when we have the Cabinet Secretary with us, do you think? Uh, yes, we could, we could ask if they were prepared to speak on that. Yeah, it, I just wonder, since it's very fresh, if, if they were with us next week, whether we could just slip in an extra, just to get an understanding of what, what they think they could be doing to accelerate this. Because it is a matter of considerable public concern. But obviously, that they may feel that they would prefer to wait for yes. a later date. But let's see if that is a possibility. Um, petition number 1952, Specialist Services for Patients with Autonomic Dysfunction. Uh, this has been lodged by Jane Clark, and it calls on the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government to instruct Scotland's NHS to form specialist services training resources and a clinical pathway for the diagnosis and treatment of patients exhibiting symptoms of autonomic nervous system dysfunction, uh, dysautonomia. Jane tells us that autonomic nervous system disorders are common and are also often a complication of long COVID. She highlights the severe impact of this condition on people's quality of life and life expectancy. Jane says in Scotland there is no clinical pathway for dysautonomia, no specialist hub to diagnose and treat patients, and no access to local or regional health care for most patients. She highlights challenges in referrals to specialists in England, lengthy treatment delays and related impacts of this on individuals, including children. In a further submission, Jane provides additional information and comments on the Scottish Government's response. She quotes a member of the NICE expert panel on long-term effects of COVID-19, who states that Scotland does not currently follow the relevant guidance in relation to multidisciplinary doctor-led services, and notes that a lack of data on the prevalence of such conditions means that there is also no data on whether Scottish services are adequate. The Scottish Government response states that there is an expertise to manage these conditions in Scotland and where additional expertise is required, pathways are in place to allow patients to access services in England. This also states that the clinical guideline for identifying, addressing and managing the long-term effects of COVID-19 is supported by the Scottish Government Implementation Support Note, which has been circulated to all NHS health boards. Do members have any comments or suggestions? Mr Stewart. I thank you, Convener. To write to the stakeholders seeking their views on the actions carried for uh, the petition, specifically asking for the views uh, for scale on issues uh, that the committee can write to the Brain Charity, 
Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland, Botch UK, Professor Alan Carson and the National Service Scotland, and to write to the petitioner alerting them to the funding schemes available through the Chief Scientist's Office. Thank you. Thank you, you Mr Stewart. Um, do any colleagues have any other additional comments or suggestions, or are we content to progress as Mr Stewart has suggested? I believe we are. Thank you. We'll keep the petition open and proceed on that basis. Uh, petition number 1953 to review education support staff roles. And this has been lodged by Rosin Taylor Young. And it calls the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review education support, their staff roles, in order to consider one, urgently raising wages for education support staff across primary and secondary sectors to £26,000 per annum. Increasing the hours of the working day for educational support staff from 27.5 to 35 hours. Allowing ESS to work on personal learning plans with teachers take part in multi-agency meetings. To require ESS to register with Scottish Social Services Council and to paying ES staff monthly. Rosin uh, emphasises that importance of staff support staff, stating they are absolutely essential to children's education, support, care and well-being. She also tells us that support staff are bitterly overworked, her words, and chronically underpaid, noting that there have been a number of equal pay claims for Scottish councils. The SPICE briefing states that current classroom assistants are not required to have a professional registration, but that the Scottish Government is committed to exploring options for the development of an accredited qualification and registration programme for additional support needs specialists, assistants rather, in collaboration with trade unions and other key stakeholders. And these will result in final proposals, which are due to be brought forward by the autumn of next year. The Scottish Government highlight that Pupil Support Staff Working Group, which has been established to consider how pupil support staff can be empowered and supported, and they state that the group is currently engaged with pupil support staff, seeking their views on the work of the group. Do the members have any comments or suggestions on this petition? And Mr Stewart, you're stepping forward again. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Uh, to write to the Scottish Government to ask how it intends to engage uh, with stakeholders in its deliveries of the commitment to explore options uh, for the development of an accredited qualification and registration programme for additional support and needs assistance, and how the petitioner can engage with the pupil support staff working group. Also, to write to COSLA, seeking a view on the issues raised in the petition and requesting information on the frequency and cost of the equal pay claims lodged in relation to education support staff roles, and to write to the Scottish Social Services Council, seeking a view on the issues raised in the petition and requesting information on the requirements for and processes of that registration. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Mr Stewart. Are members of the committee content to progress as recommended. Any other suggestions? No? Thank you very much. And can I just say to those uh, petitioners who petition we've considered for the first time, just so, as you know, as a matter of practice, that we do invite the Scottish Government in the first instance to comment, so we do have their response and any further submissions that have been received before we come forward with the recommendations and considerations at this stage this morning. But thank you all for your new petitions today. And that brings us now to the end of the formal part of our meeting. Uh, and we'll now be moving into um, a private session for agenda item four, and we'll convene as a committee next on the 23rd of November. And therefore I suspend the meeting uh, at this point. Thank you. <laughs>